Wow, this is so exciting to look out and see all of these women together for the same purpose or aligning in the same way anyway. You may have your own purpose for being here. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so I'm going to open it up and talk about a different kind of core stability. Kind of physical, but mostly other stuff too. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a concept I call deep health. And we'll talk about what that means in a second, but let me just give you a, a little bit of uh, background. And before I even do that, there's going to be a lot of stuff coming at you at this event. And it can be very overwhelming, like, ah, how am I going to remember it all, right? What if I forget stuff? I've already forgotten everyone's name, so please do not take this personally. Um, so what I encourage you to do, I asked you to bring your trusty writing stick, capture just one thing from this presentation that speaks to you. Now obviously if you get more than one, awesome, right? But I'm a big fan of just the one thing, okay? So it can be question, comment, idea, oh that was really useful, I have to think about that. Just think about what is your one thing that you'll get out of this presentation? And when you hear it, you'll be like, oh, got to write that down, right? So just be looking for one thing. That's pretty good, right? You don't have to, you don't have to remember any more than that. I also want to open with a little bit of a disclaimer. You might have no idea what you're doing here. You, might, you may be new to exercise or even old to exercise, but you still don't know what the hell you're doing. You might not know how to interact with other fit women because you've never seen another one before. You're the only one at your gym. It doesn't matter, OK? That's OK. Um, here is a place where we can be wrong, where we can ask stupid questions. I love stupid questions. The stupider, the, actually with my coaches, I'm often like, give me the stupidest question you've got. I haven't really he heard any good ones yet, but learning is a risk. And this is where we take that risk in an environment that is welcoming, that is friendly, that is collaborative. You know, as the saying goes in fighting, it's like sweat in the gym over blood on the ring, right? This is where we make our mistakes and ask questions and learn. So, so let me start by sharing some insight that I have gained from coaching 30,000 clients. Um, so I work for a company called Precision Nutrition. Does anyone know Precision Nutrition? A few folks. All right. All right. Um, so I write their coaching program, and I write most of their curriculum. So if you've been level one certified, if you're in the level two program, I, I write that program. We're rewriting level one textbook. Um, and so when you coach online, you can get quite a lot of clients, right? 30,000 is a lot. Um, and so that's kind of like a nice little aquarium of humanity for us, right? We get to see what do people do and think and feel. We have them for a year. So we get some pretty cool insight. We've been in this business for like 10 years. Um, again, 30,000 clients. We've enrolled about 16,000 coaches in our certification. We work with everyone from average people to elite athletes. We don't work a lot with children, but we've had some children, youth, everyone from kids to 70s. So we kind of have a good idea of what it takes to get into shape, to get healthy, to perform well, and so forth. Now I'm going to embarrass her. Tony, where are you? I'm right here. There's Tony. This is Coach Tony. Hey. hey. This is one of our PN coaches, one of our more experienced PN coaches, but she's also one of our finalists and our winners. So she has pretty much experience uh, at every level of the chain. So we run a transformation contest with our coaching program as well. Um, and this is Tony winning her, her money, which is very exciting. <laughs> but what we discovered in this process of running a transformation contest is that to change your outsides, you got to change your insides. And maybe you don't feel like changing your outsides. Maybe you're like, OK, this, this situation is good, awesome. But to maintain healthy outsides, you still have to have healthy insides. Now, obviously, that could mean our blood chemistry, it could mean our metabolism. But I'm kind of talking about what's up here, what's in here, and what's here deep down in your guts. So a lot of clients would come to us, and they'd be like, yeah, 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 give me the awesome meal plan or the secret thing you guys do. I'm like, there's no meal plan. You got to get right with this. And they're like, I don't want that. Hell no, I don't even want to interact with anything between here and here, right? <laughs> um, 
so this is, this is kind of the first argument I'm going to make to you. So who here knows the exercise, the five whys? All right, this is fresh material. Awesome. OK, so like day two or three of our coaching program, with people we do this exercise. And it's very simple. If you have a toddler at home, you will recognize the concept. <laughs> you start by asking one why. Why are you in coaching, is what we ask them. And then, in response to the answer you give, you ask why again. So why am I in P and coaching? Well, I'm here because uh, I want to lose weight. OK, uh, so why do you want to lose weight? Well, I, um, I feel like it would make me feel better. OK, uh, well, why do you want to feel better? Why is that important to you? Well, I just feel like, you know, kind of when I go out in the world, if I feel better, you know, I'll just, I'll just kind of feel better about interacting with the world. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, why is interacting with the world in a more kind of positive way important to you? Well, you know, I just, I don't really feel that great about myself right now. And, you know, Bob and I just broke up and now I'm thinking about dating and I'm kind of insecure. Like you're already by the fourth why, you're getting at some really good stuff. It goes way more, it goes much deeper than I want to lose weight. You're getting at someone's deep why. So that's what we're going to start with. We'll just take a couple of minutes. Uh, you can use your little writing stick and jot it down. Um, so I'd like you to consider the question, why are you here? And then to whatever answer you give, ask yourself why again. And keep asking things like why, or why is that important? Why is that meaningful? What difference would that make to me? Okay, so you just keep building on your previous answers. Let's just take a couple minutes, capture your thoughts. Okay, is anyone brave enough to share their deepest why of why they are here? Yeah? I'm here because I feel like um, I belong. Like I'm around people who think like me and um, it energizes me to go out and share that with other people. I got goosebumps when you said that. You can see the hair on my arms. That's amazing. I feel like I belong. What a tremendous answer. Someone else. Yes? I'm here because it's forcing me to do stuff that I never thought myself capable of doing. Oh, I'm here because I'm, it's forcing me to do stuff I never thought I was capable of doing. That's another powerful one. Someone else. Yep. Um, I'm here because I keep hearing women struggle with the same things over and over. And I'd like to be someone that can show them there's a better way. Amazing. Yes. Showing women a better way, because women struggle with all the same things. So you may have come here thinking, I'm not this enough. I'm not that enough. Uh, you know, Everyone else is going to be better than me at blah, blah, blah. Um, people are meeting me. They're like, you're so much smaller than I thought. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. This. Um, but all of us are kind of walking around with that script, right? And we think we're the only one. I tell you, 30,000 clients, you are not a special snowflake. I mean, you are, you know, to the people that love you. But, you know, I always hear people say, like, um, has anyone that you've worked with had a knee injury? And I'm like, yeah, get in line. We all do. <laughs> so I asked you to think about this. And, I, and um, you can jot down some notes if you want. I won't make you reflect on it right now. But this is something you might think about through the course of this weekend, which is, what does strength mean to you? And probably your definition of this will change over today, over the weekend, over the next few months, over your life, whatever. And the other thing I've asked you to think about is, who is the strongest woman that you know, and what makes her that way? What features does she have? What characteristics? What does she do? How does she think? So let me share with you the strongest woman I know. This is my grandma. Aw. She's super cute. And if you think I'm small, you should see her. You can see in the picture, like, that's me relative to her. So at my house, we measure height by Krista units. So she's like a 0.8 KU. Um, <laughs> so she's 89, and she lives alone in the, in the cabin in the remote north, OK? Like, not just rural, but remote. So basically, if you go straight north and just keep going into the forest with the moose, that's where she lives in Canada. So basically, here's, here's a short recap of her life. Uh, horrible childhood, lost a brother, her mom died, was institutionalized, uh, 
lived through the Great Depression, had to leave school with a grade six education, had a lousy husband, whole run of family tragedies. Um, in her cabin in northern Ontario, she did not have electricity and running water. So one day she told me, yeah, we used to keep our food in the hole in the ground. And I was like, not quite sure I heard this right. Like a whole hole? She's like, yeah, you know, like you dig with a shovel and you put your food in because it's cooler underground. I was like, makes sense. So until the 1960s, she kept her food in a hole in the ground. This was her toilet until the 90s. Okay, so imagine using this on a northern morning. It's very <laughs> refreshing, very exciting. Uh, she also has advanced osteoporosis, multiple spinal fractures. She weighs about 85 pounds. She likes to walk. <laughs> um, but she was... <laughs> She was ostracized by her walking club for walking too fast. Um, they didn't like that. And she's still hauling her own damn dirt. So the top of the slide got cut off a little bit. But yeah, whenever I go to visit her, um, and she can't carry a bunch of stuff at once, but she's like, I just put one log in the wagon, and I pull it, and I put another. I mean, she'll do it all day. So I said, like, Grandma, are you on any medications? No, that's for sick people. So <laughs> here she is, Grandma Ruby. That's some strength. So strength comes from the core, right? And this is true whether we're talking about physical performance, whether we're talking about performance in life, kind of just getting through whatever life has to offer you. So this concept we've been thinking about at Precision Nutrition is called, we, we call it deep health. Um, so, I mean, I could throw this question out to you, and we'll, we'll actually get into this right now. But it's worth thinking about, what does it mean to you to be healthy at a deep level? Because I'm sure we can think of times that we were not healthy at a deep level. You know, when things were out of order in our bodies and our lives and things were not working together. So, this is your first kind of uh, exercise. Um, so in your handout package there, you should have three sheets. And we're going to fill this out together. So this is what I call the wheel of health. Okay, so deep health is really about having all of the aspects of your body, your mind, your spirit, your relationships, all that stuff working together. So we can break this into a few different domains. So you notice at the bottom we've got some pretty obvious ones, right? Like health and function. What's your metabolic health? What's your, you know, are, you, are you running a, a healthy body composition? Um, and I should say that's a much wider range, I think, than people expect. How's your physical performance? How's that working? How's your overall health? And then we can get into other stuff, like um, your, your, your relationships. How are your intimate relationships you know, with your partners? How are your family relationships with your immediate family? How are your relationships with your friends, your colleagues, your coworkers? And what's, the, what's your general social support network look like? Then we can look at your, your work that you do, whatever that is. Do you have a sense of control over your work? Do you have a good work-life balance? Do you have enough money? Do you feel stable financially? Right? Do you feel like, or you don't know where your next paycheck or meal is coming from? And is your work meaningful to you? Is there some value? You know, we've talked about helping people. That's one way of finding meaning. And then your personal growth. How's your ongoing learning and development? How's your joy, your pleasure, your happiness? When I talk to female clients about pleasure and joy, they're like, I don't, what? What is fun? What is this fun thing you're talking about? All right? I'm like, why don't you enjoy your food? They're like, I don't, mm, don't know how to compute that, right? So how much joy is in your life? Do you have a sense of larger purpose? Is there a thing you feel like you're put on earth to do? Um, and what's your physical environment? What's around you? Okay? So the way to use this exercise is you just color it in. So the bigger your pie wedge, the more you feel like stuff is going well in that domain. And then, you know, for, so for example, in this one, this person does not feel like they have control over their work. They have just a tiny little pie wedge. Right? However, they have pretty good daily life function and mobility. They've got that wedge all colored in. So take a minute and color in your little wheel of health and see what you discover. 
Okay. So uh, let me just ask what a, a couple of you discovered by filling this out. Was there anything that surprised you or like, yeah, looking pretty good, right on track, or like, whoo, <laughs> tiny, tiny, tiny little wedges here. I've got to work on something. What, what kind of pops for you as you look? Yep. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> all right, good, good. <laughs> Life's fi firing on all cylinders. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so your complaining pie wedge is huge too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I feel like my work life balance, like trying to balance being a mom, mm. life, and work. Yeah. And getting my kids everywhere is like zero. Yes. <laughs> yes. And does everyone else who, who feels that way? If you've got kids, work life balance, or if you don't, yeah. Yeah. I just I saw an interesting article recently. It was called something like um, "Married Woman, Single Mom." And it was all about, you know, you have a partner, but yet you're doing a lot of this stuff. So, yeah, very common. Anything else that popped for people just kind of off the top of your head? Yep. Physical environment is something I didn't think about. Interesting. Uh, and now that I'm thinking about it, I'm, I think my husband does most of the cleaning, and I'm kind of a slob. And you know what? I think that bothers me. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> All right, it's good. We're solving your marital problems. And <laughs> Get a cleaning woman. This is my advice for marital harmony, if possible. Holy cow! Yep. A cleaning man. A cleaning man. A cleaning person. Yes. Um, okay. So let's talk about alignment. Now, obviously, you know, if we think about alignment, it's like we could talk about posture. Right, and of course the physical therapists in this room are like, yeah, that looks, you know, that looks like how I think of alignment. We can also kind of think about a life posture. How are you aligned in your life? Is it a strong kind of posture in your own life? And there's lots of ways you can think about this. Here's how I break it down. I break it down into identity, values, priorities, and goals. And we'll talk about those one by one. Identity is like, how are you showing up? Who do you think you are? One of the things I used to grapple with at these kinds of events was I used to think, well, I'm not an athlete. So what right do I have to tell anyone how to get into shape? Because I'm a bookworm. That was my identity. And after 20 years of training and, uh, you know, gassing out a lot of the guys at my gym, I'm like, ah, you know, maybe some, maybe some part of me is an athlete. Even if I failed gym class in grade eight, maybe it's time to kind of rewrite that story, right? And so what's your story? What's your script for your life? Does it need a rewrite? Is it time to refresh it? Are you telling yourself the same story that you told yourself 20 years ago? What are your values? What matters most to you? Sometimes we only know this when, they, when our values get infringed on. I had a conversation yesterday, uh, not yesterday, last week with one of the uh, folks I work with. And she said, you think too much about people. And I was so mad when she said that. I was like, screw you, I do not, right? <laughs> um, but I realized afterwards, sometimes we get angry when someone infringes on a core value. So I was kind of like, hey man, thanks for finding that core value for me. Um, what is right? Like, what do you think in, in your heart of hearts is right? Priorities, what's most important to you right now? You know, different things over your life change. I mean, Cassandra talked a little bit about her changing fitness priorities. Ten years ago, all I wanted to do was to get lean and to fight. That was my thing. I wanted to be like the lean and rip shizzled fighter and beat the crap out of people. And I trained super hard. and. You know, that was so important to me. And looking back, I'm not really sure why that was important to me. But at the time, it seemed very crucial. Um, now my priority is don't go out like a sucker, OK? I'm 42 years old. Got to keep the machine running so I can end up like Grandma Ruby. Okay? So my priority is sustainability, sanity, you know, preparing for the zombie apocalypse kind of stuff. Um, so what's your first things first? So you have another worksheet. And what you can see on the worksheet is how your identities, values, and priorities kind of flow from each other. So 
to find your identity, one of the questions you can ask yourself, or one of the blanks you can fill in is, I'm the kind of person who what? Okay. I'm the kind of person who whatever. Then you can find your values from that. OK, because I'm that kind of person, it's important to me that what? I'm the kind of person who cares about people, so it's important to me that people are treated with dignity. So I would feel good about accomplishing what? Something that helps people. So go ahead and fill out your worksheet. Start with your identity, the kind of person you are, and how you notice what's important to you and what you'd feel good about accomplishing flows from that. Also notice where your identity feels right. Like when you hit it, you're like, yeah, that's me. Or where it feels like maybe a bit of a misfit. I used to think of myself as an academic. I don't feel that anymore. Okay? So notice what feels congruent, what feels right and natural, like, yeah, that's me. And notice where like, the itchy, like misfit, like, uh, it doesn't feel quite like me pieces are. Just go ahead and just jot some notes down. It's OK if this is a stumper. Or if you're like, I don't know who I am. That's fine. <laughs> I don't know either sometimes. Um, you know, stuff will pop for you as you ruminate or marinate. I like to, I like to call it marinating on this. So This is maybe also the kind of conversation you have with someone else. Hey, what kind of person do you think I am? Sometimes that's surprising. Sometimes you get answers you expect, and sometimes you're like, whoa, did not expect that. So it's OK to take your time with this. This is sort of like, <laughs> this is like a philosophy of your life in one minute, basically. OK, so what, what popped for you as you filled this out? Something that was expected, unexpected, you're feeling really good about how everything's flowing, you're like, ooh, I'm completely acting in contravention to my identity. What, what did you guys notice as you sort of initially thought about this? What popped? Yes? So uh, for me, it was like, OK, what's really at the core? Mm. Uh, OK, I'm the, you know, something that's very superficial, but what's really at the core? Mm. And um, so for me, it's that I thrive on change. You know, I have to think about, nice. you know, it was a lot of working backwards. Yeah. So, so then, um, but I'm also very, I, I, at the end, I need to feel grounded in that change. Right. So in between, it takes asking questions, doing research, you know, doing, getting answers so that the next step is grounded, whatever that is, wherever I'm going. Nice. So, it, you know, it kind of works backwards. Yeah. At that point. And you've kind of intuitively gotten to the next step, which we'll talk about in a second, which is thinking about the outcome. Like, what am I actually working towards? Sometimes you don't know. You're just kind of trying to get there. But you've defined an outcome, which is really useful as well. Yeah. Other folks, what did you notice? What popped? Yep. There's an incongruency between who I identify myself as and where I am. Mm. Mm-hmm. Having taken time off to be a mom. Yeah. So there's an incongruity between where you are and, and what's kind of Ooh, your situation. Really yeah. yeah. Anyone else notice that? A little bit of an incongruity? What she just said, like, a yeah. year ago, I went through that. Ah. I turned 29, and, like, it was kind of like, oh, God, 30 is next. So I kind of had that whole, like, you know, thing a year early, I guess. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> the late 20s crisis. I guess. Yeah. So, so thank God I'm track, and I feel better now. But, yeah. Yeah. And that's such a good point, too, because what we're kind of getting at is that, you know, just like, uh, does anyone rock climb? Okay, a few people, okay. There's a concept of the crux in climbing, right? There's sort of, when you, when you climb up a wall, often there's a point where things kind of get weird or there's like a sudden turn or there's like a kind of a, I don't know, just a conflict point in this route. And they call it the crux. Um, and the root of that is like a crossroads, right? And so often we come to these cruxes, these crossroads in our lives, and it can be anything. Because sometimes we have crossroads in our lives and we're like, this isn't a very good crossroads. I just turned, you know, I'm, not, oh, I'm not even 29, you know, like, it's, how am I having this crisis at 28, right? It feels a little bit illegitimate. But the cruxes are there and they're very real. So whatever crossroad you're at, often it's a crossroad because something <laughs> here is out of sync, right? Or 
your identity's changing. I, um, when I had, my, I had multiple midlife crises, uh, and when I had one of mine, uh, when I left academia, I went to go see this therapist, and she was so amazingly fabulous. She was like uh, Brigitte Bardot, but like older. So she was French, and she had this little dog that would be there with us. I think his name was like Bijou or something, of course, right? <laughs> And I'm telling her about this, and I'm like, yeah, but I used to be this, and I used to be that. And she looked at me, and like, she has these amazing like, French you know, like, uh, nails and stuff. She's like, yes, but you are no longer this person. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> I'm no longer this person, right? And so this is sometimes uh, what challenges us, is that we want to hold on to an identity that's familiar, a story that's familiar. We know our stories. We know our scripts. But that's not who we are anymore. So that's a sticky and tricky place to be. So at Precision Nutrition, we have this metaphor. You might know it. Uh, the idea is, you know, if you, have to have a, if you have a jar and you have to fill it up with rocks and then little pebbles and sand, of course, if you put the pebbles in first or the sand, the little things, you can't get everything in. But if you put the big rocks in, right, the most important things first, then you can kind of fill things around it. And this applies to fitness, health, and life, right? What do I want to do? You don't always know. It's OK. It's a good question to ask. What are the fundamentals that will get me there? So if you do a sport, you know. Fundamentals first, always, right? If I want to play soccer, I better be pretty good at walking, right? <laughs> I better be pretty good at supporting my body on one leg before I can even get to this. So it's worth asking, you know, no matter whether you're thinking, again, about fitness, wellness, life, career, relationships, what do I want to do? And what are the basics, the fundamentals? What is walking in my domain of what I want to change? Super secret coaching tip, there's no next level. A lot of our clients come to us, they're like, give me the next level shit. And I'm like, yeah, there's nothing, actually. <laughs> there's no magic secret. And they get mad about that, right? Um, and I think part of that is, uh, so for example, uh, with, our, which are, with our coaches, we train coaches, one of the exercises we had them do is listen to people. Go out and like really listen to someone. And a lot of people are like, well, that's just stupid. I already know how to listen to people. And I'm like, if you had practiced listening to people, you would not say that. Because you would know how incredibly difficult it is to be a good listener. So it's kind of a paradox. When you know the basics, you know how diffi difficult the basics are. So here's an example of that. Um, so I used to do judo for a few years, and there's this move called the foot sweep. And all it is is I'm kind of holding you, and I just kick your legs out from under you, right? Super simple concept, except if you're just standing there, and I'm like kicking at you, you're not going to go over, right? You get a bruised ankle. We all used to walk around with bruised ankles, right? Because we would kick each other. Um, but the trick to the foot sweep is that it has to be at an exact moment, just as I am stepping. So if I am your opponent and I am stepping, see that moment where I'm kind of falling into space? That's when I take your foot. Now, that's way easier than it actually is. It sounds way easier than it actually is. And so one of the things we would practice is you know we'd have a partner step forward and back step forward and back in front of us and we'd be down on our hands and knees like this seeing if we could get that moment when the foot was just hanging in air right and i sucked at this i was so bad but what makes and but my my, my judo teacher was a master of this he was a guy he trained in japan for like 50 years um <laughs> and he could just make you fall down. And you weren't even really sure how it happened. You were just on the floor all of a sudden. <laughs> but he was the master because he had the basic. He had the tiny nuance, the command of this very fundamental piece. All he did was know when you were stepping. Nothing simpler than that, right? But he could do it incredibly well. That's the secret to mastery. A lot of us are looking for, for, for perfection. You want excellence and mastery. Master your craft. If you're coaches, here's another little secret coaching tip. No one cares how awesome you are. <laughs> and you may be awesome. I'm sure that you are. They want you to help them. 
They want you to be a master of your coaching craft. Okay? Mastery is way more exciting to me than perfection. Because mastery is growth. So master your foot sweeps. Um, another thing we say in fighting, position before submission. What this means is that before you try a super awesome fancy move, you have to hold the person in place. Right? So if I try, if I'm like, you know, channeling Ronda Rousey, and I try to get a cool arm bar, if I can't hold her in place, I have nothing. So the way we can apply this to fitness in life is cover your bases. If you look at your wheel of health, what's missing from the foundation? Do you have your position before you're attempting the submission? I had a friend once who actually um, did not secure position. He tried a flying armbar. So that's like when you jump on the person and you try to armbar them. Um, but he ended up knocking himself out. So he <laughs> leaped on the person, missed them, fell off, and knocked himself out. So don't go like that. OK, there's a catch. Focus on what you can control. And I don't mean be a control freak. I mean understand what you have total control over which is very few things, I assure you, what you have some control over and what you have no control over. And this is a really key concept because often we try to control things that we don't have control over. I was telling folks yesterday, I, I flew in kind of in a thunderstorm. It wasn't even kind of, it was a full on thunderstorm. And you know, and I was sitting there going, well, here we are, right? As we're like, blah, 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 and things were rattling. And I mean, when they strapped the flight attendants in, that's when you know things are getting real. So I'm just like, and I, I thought, well, here we, like, what am I going to do? Right? I got nothing here. The only thing I can control is my mind and how I'm showing up to this. So the first time we dropped, I squealed like a little girl. <laughs> I don't mind admitting it. Like it was a, I mean, it was a drop. It was some serious business. And I was like, Yee! and I was like, okay, no, dude, you have control over how you show up to this. That's the only thing you have control over right now. You don't have control of the thunder gods. You don't have control of the pilot. All you have is the control of your mind. So it really helps. And you can just do this on your own. You can draw a little diagram and think about, what can I control? And what can I not control? Here's one thing you can control. An awesomeness-based approach to your life, your fitness, your health, whatever. So now most of us like to work on fixing our weaknesses, right? Especially if you're a physical therapist or you're a coach. You see weaknesses and you're like, oh, I got to fix that. And look at your posture and your hips. Your... When, I, when my coach first saw my, my pelvic position, I, I was like Donald Duck. I was like, I was like this. And he was like, ah, ugh, you know, my eyes, that's terrible, right? So we're kind of, we're working the pelvis thing. Um, but the temptation is to want to fix your weaknesses and to focus on what you think are your weaknesses. I'm going to suggest that you flip it around. And I like this 90-10 rule. Spend 90% of your time, energy, mental real estate, resources, whatever you got, on strengthening your strengths. So there's no point me learning to play basketball, right? But how about weightlifting, right? Perfect. I always, I'm always like telling my husband, I was like, do you think my quads are just like too amazing, right? <laughs> too, um, <laughs> um, and then 10% of your time, Neutralize your weaknesses. Don't even worry about fixing them. Just get it so you don't set yourself on fire. Okay? So you have people around you who can neutralize them. I was telling Nick uh, how grateful I was for all his organizing. Organizing is an amazing ability that I'm not great at. So I have people around me that neutralize that. That's why Nick was invented to make this 10% more awesome. And so he's a 90% organizational awesomeness. So we can think about this in terms of athletics. I mean, I look around, there's all different bodies, ages, um, skills. So this is the British sumo wrestling team. Um, they average around six feet tall. To be in the, uh, the heavyweight weight class, you have to be over 176. Obviously, these folks are heavier than that. Um, it's a big advantage in sumo. The bigger you are, you know, the tougher you are. So here's one lady. Um, she's around 450, six feet tall in sumo. That's what you want to be, right? This, this body would not do well at sumo. That body is an excellent sumo player. Now we have the opposite, an elite level marathoner. So the stats on elite level marathoners for women, they're getting smaller, first of all. They're around 5'4", so to be like world class, 
you're probably going to want to be around 5'4 or shorter, around 104 pounds, and, and like as small and light as you can possibly be, because it takes less energy to move that body, you know, for miles and miles and miles. If you want to be a basketball player, obviously you can't be me. Um, you have to be tall, heavy, big, strong, powerful, long arms and legs, right? Um, apparently some of the women in the NBA, there's one, I forget her name, her hands are bigger than LeBron James. So you need the kind of flipper hands, right, to catch, catch the balls. Um, this is a place where your body will thrive, right? Basketball. If you have this kind of body, this is where you will thrive. Conversely, if you have the opposite or, you know, the other end of the spectrum, if you're five feet tall, tiny, 100 pounds, gymnastics, that'll be your thing. When I grew up, I was like the smallest kid in my class. Let me tell you, you can climb a rope when you weigh 50 pounds amazingly well. When I hit puberty, I was like, I don't, what is dragging me down here? But I was great at gymnastics when I, because I was small. It's a great body type for it. So the point here is, don't waste time on fixing yourself because you aren't broken. You aren't broken in any way. Your body is magnificent. The fact that you're alive is like a miracle, frankly, if you think about all the stuff that had to happen. Find your tribe. Find your fit. Where do you fit? What's your sport? What's your activity? What's your domain of life? What work were you called to do? Find your tribe. Find your fit. Okay, let's talk about making it happen. Common question we hear from clients, I've been thinking about working out. How come I'm not in shape? I read all the fitness blogs. I don't know why stuff's not happening. Or I know what to do. I just don't do it. I'm sure you hear this a lot. And we tell this ourselves, too. We all know what to do. Change comes from what you do. Action, action, action. You must behave yourself into change. So often people are like, ah, I have to get motivated. I'm like, first of all, don't waste your time on motivation. It's like a cat, okay, comes and goes, usually not around when you need it. <laughs> act first, okay? You gotta act over and over and over. So let's imagine a continuum. So, so now you're wondering, okay, what kind of action should I take? How should it fit into my life? Let's, ma let's imagine a continuum. And it's a continuum on the one hand, you've got bullshit. And I don't know why I asterisk out the I, because this is the kind of place where, you know, we, we drop the bombs. But anyway, I apologize if I offend any ladylike sensibilities. So on one end of your continuum, you've got bullshit. On the other end of your continuum, you've got insanity. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> bullshit, you're bullshitting yourself. You're under expecting stuff from yourself. You're underworking. You show up to the workout and you're like, eh, it's really hot, <laughs> right? You have low expectations of yourself, like, oh, no, I could never. It's just, and it's just too much, right? I remember one of our clients one time, someone said to her, you know, if you mix whey protein, like flavored whey protein and cottage cheese, it's actually not so bad. It's like a cheesecake kind of thing. And this client said, oh, my God, I could never do that. I'm terrified. I'm like, of mixing two substances <laughs> together. <laughs> that would be on the bullshit end of things. Um, <laughs> quitting early, you know, like, oh, blah, right? Forget it. Slacking, I, I just can't, or like, just whatever, just apathy, right? And sanity is the opposite, right? It's, it's overwork, workaholism, grinding yourself into the ground, 10 CrossFit workouts a day, and you go for a run, perfectionism, it's not knowing when to quit. Because sometimes you gotta quit and it's a smart move, right? You have to know when to tap out. So you wanna find that place between tapping out too early and the point before someone breaks your arm. So it's not knowing when to quit. It's trying to be superwoman, right? Trying to do it all, have it all, blah, blah, right? And thinking like you have to. I have to do this. And this is all really, really important. We, have, we had a client many years ago, we call her the bean lady. Um, and, and at one point someone suggested, hey, maybe you could um, eat beans. Eat beans. Uh, beans are a high fiber, good source of carbs, whatever. 
And she was like freaking out. What, what kind of beans? How many beans do I eat? I can't believe you're telling me to eat beans. That's when you're like way too wound up. That's when you know like it's time to dial back a little bit, right? But more, than, more kind of seriously, insanity is when you don't know what to prioritize, right? You don't know what is important. Beans are not important. <laughs> so you should be here, somewhere in the middle between bullshit and insanity. So giving yourself a break, awesome. Self-compassion, awesome. Kindness, care, love for yourself, awesome. Giving yourself a break. There's just some, this morning I got up and I tried to work out and I was like, I kind of just dialed it in. I was like, all right, today's not the day to push. That's cool. Come back tomorrow. Um, so you find yourself, so, so on the one hand, you, you give yourself the best elements of this, right? The kindness, the compassion, the care. But also you dip into this sometimes. Sometimes you push a little bit. Sometimes you try something a little uncomfortable, a little tougher. Um, you know, just find that middle ground. So your final exercise, and for this one I suggest you get the person next to you to help you with it because it is a bit of a collaborative process. Um, at PN we say nothing worth doing can be done alone. Whenever you're thinking about health, wellness, change, it is fundamentally a collaborative process. A lot of us are do-it-yourselfers, as value, builds independence, but ultimately a health project is collaborative. So, feel free to collaborate with your seatmate on this. Here's the recipe. Take your ideal strong woman, whoever you think that is in your mind. Take what you noticed as your identity, values, and priorities. Take areas of your wheel where you feel good or you feel excited about developing. Okay, and that's very key. So don't take your, oh, you know, here's the area where I'm shitty, meh, right? <laughs> no. Be like, hey, either I'm doing awesome at this, or, hey, you know what, that's not so full, but I'm excited about making it better. Hey, maybe my social network isn't so great. You know, I'd love to go meet new people. That's exciting, okay? So find an area that you're either doing well or feel excited about developing further. Think about your strengths, where you fit, who's your tribe, and come up with an action plan. And the challenge I'll throw out to you is to start it today, and here's how. So the, other, the final sheet that you've got, this is a little exercise we do with our clients. You start with the outcome that you're seeking. This can be big, it can be small, it can be like get to the end of today, it doesn't matter. But I encourage you to think a little bit big. We call this the destination postcard. So imagine that like future awesome you has sent you a postcard back. What would future awesome you say that you're doing, right? Hey, old me, 2015, August, guess what I'm doing right now? You would not believe it. It is the coolest, right? What would future awesome you be up to? That's your outcome. Now work backwards. Okay, in order to get to future awesome me, this month I will do something. This week I'll do something. And then today I'll do something. So let's say my future awesome me uh, is going to um, go on a really cool surfing trip to Central America. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm a lousy swimmer and I don't know how to surf very well, so clearly there's some work to be done. Um, and I'm working on my Spanish. So, okay. So outcome, awesome surf trip to Central America. That's good. I like that. That feels good and inspiring. So what am I going to do this month to work towards that? Well, um, I might hit the swimming pool work on my swimming a little bit. I might uh, work on my Spanish a little bit. I've got a Spanish teacher, so maybe I'll see her a few times. What am I going to do this week? Okay, now we're getting a little more concrete. This week, I will go to the pool one time. Pretty sure I can make that happen one time. I will also read Spanish for five minutes a day, every day this week. I'll check the Spanish news. What am I going to do today? You know what, today I got a few minutes, I'm going to get online and research surfing schools in Costa Rica. That's my action plan. And everything leads to the destination. So everything I do is working towards that endpoint. More importantly, I can start it right now. At the break, I could be Googling surf schools, Costa Rica, right? It makes me feel like I can do something right now. So your final exercise, 
take your, your sheet, start creating an action plan for where you want to go. And collaborate with your seat mates. If you're stuck on something, ask for help. Hey, I want to go surfing in Costa Rica. I don't even know how to get there. Help me out. <laughs> this is really important. This really has to happen. Okay, so take the next five minutes and start coming up with an action plan. Cassandra's asked me to do uh, a, 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 a sort of brain body exercise. So here's one that I have come up with. So let me, show you, let me show you what it looks like and then you guys can get into partners and do it. So I need a volunteer though, and I will not make you fall on the ground. Just, I'll put that disclaimer, I will not foot sweep you. Volunteer. All right, this, this is the benefit of sitting in the front row. Okay, so it's a very simple exercise. We call it sticky hands, and you do it in martial arts to, to learn and feel your partner's weight shift. So one person will kind of drive and the other person has to respond and then you can switch. So just give me your palm, okay? All you're gonna do, so the driver is going to just move and you're gonna try to follow, okay? So I might come back, you have to follow me. I might go around in a circle, I might go down low, over, you know. So all you're doing is following, okay? And it teaches you to feel the person's weight shift, okay? Cool. So sticky hands, 30 seconds, one person, 30 seconds, the other person, thank you.